Hello everyone, I'm Bill Harris and welcome to a very special episode of Life Questions. As we start the new year, we bring you our first ever youth pastoral panel on this show. Today's program will be all about youth. So let's get started right away. I want to have you meet our new panel. We have in the studio with us today, Tori Bredigan. Did I get it right that time? Yes. Right, okay. <laughs> first Church of New Knoxville. She is the youth and children's pastor there. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you've got your hands full. Yeah. Followed by Pastor Andrew Road of Calvary Chapel of Praise. And he is titled the family pastor there. Next we have London Stapleton of Harvest Baptist in Wapakoneta, director of youth ministries there. Happy to have you. And rounding up our panel today is Pastor Phil Starr, who is of course the uh, youth pastor at the Lima Community Church right here in Lima, Ohio. Well, we're glad you all are here and we're glad for the topic. And I want to tell you because I, I did youth work for 21 years in my younger years and enjoyed it immensely. So I envy you for the positions you have. But as well, the times have changed. I mean, it, it, was, it was a challenge when I was assistant youth director. Uh, it's got to be quite a challenge for you. There's so much going on. One of the things we want to talk about is depression and the like among young people. There's an increase in suicide among young people. Uh, many young people are losing their sexual identity, changing genders and the like. The, the drug problem, the vaping problem. I mean, there's so much that you have, your, have on your hands. Let's start with the, 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 um, the depression. Let's start with the depression. Uh, that's a good place to start. What, can you describe for us, Tori, why don't you start? Describe for us what are you seeing in the way of depression among young people who we would normally think should be bubbly and bouncing and mm -hmm. all over the place, yeah. and many are not. Absolutely. The thing I think I see most in my students um, is the anxiety that then causes the depression, the pressure that they have to succeed, the pressure that they have to you know, go, go to college, to go do all of these things. Expectations. Um, huh? Yeah, these crazy expectations that I know when I was growing up were not nearly as is forceful, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but now I'm seeing that more and more that they just have this immense pressure on themselves um, to do something, to be something, um, and then also to try to navigate, you know, growing up, puberty, all of those things within that is just That's tough really, enough. really difficult. Yeah. Yeah, by itself, I mean, just, just growing up, period, is yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Well, what do you... What do you? What is your approach? What when you see all of this going on? And obviously, it's it it goes along the lines of the individual. You don't yes. have a cookie cutter approach. Yeah. But what overall? What is the approach? Yeah. So, like you said, there is really no cookie cutter approach. Oh. Um, but you know, I think a lot of it comes from being a constant person in their life of showing them love and care and support and hey you know what I'm here for you yes you have all of this pressure um, but I'm here for you I want to give you the tools to help you um, to deal with this um, whether it's anxiety or depression or even to point them in the right direction of getting further help uh, if they need that as well I think is a big role that um, us as youth pastors play is just being that steady support of checking in and showing that we care and that we see the pressure that they're under. Yeah, a couple of things that you said is you talked about uh, like tools and relationship mm -hmm. and in a voice, right? I feel like that there's so many more teens that we have now that are, have this voice that for some reason is leading them to anxiety. Yes. And, we, and we're learning more about like their, how their brains are working. We're learning more about like adolescence going way into the 20s. Uh, but, but one of the things to do relationally is to help them tune in to the voice of God, mm -hmm. who is a voice of peace and a voice of rest. And if we can get them listening to that voice and looking at their life through that level, mm -hmm. then it really helps. Yeah. It really helps starting to, it's one, it's one of the tools you can do, mm -hmm. right? I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, kind of on that same line, uh, just as I talk about students with anxiety and stuff, and one, one of the, I think the scriptures you see in, on anxiety is, is Jesus telling us in Matthew 6 about, don't worry about your life. Mm -hmm. And the reason he tells us this, and kind of what that's rooted in, is he goes through, you know, look at the sparrows, look at the flowers, look how they don't care, but it says, God loves them, and how much more does he love you? Mm -hmm. yeah. And like, you're worth so much more to him. And I think that's one of the things that as you're talking about re building relationship and listening to the voice of God, God's voice says, you know, I love you so much, you're yeah. important to me, I'm gonna take care of you. 
you don't have to be anxious yeah. because of that love. And so, you know, the, I think, as you were saying, that's like the competing voice there, one to say, be anxious, you gotta do this stuff to be good enough. And God, on the other hand, is saying, no, I love you and, and there's value. You don't have to worry about mm. these things. Mm -hmm. And that's just hard to, to get them to tune into the right voice there. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to say, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you do have to try to recognize the individual situation. And um, as you said, it's not a, a cookie cutter formula so, you know, some, some teenagers have maybe like more of a situational um, anxiety where, you know, I have a big test tomorrow, but maybe some of them are um, actually being um, abused at home and they're like, I'm just wrong. I'm scared to say the wrong thing around this person because I'm going to be harmed. So in that, in those specific situations, we do have to take sometimes different actions when we're hearing, um, when we're hearing those things and maybe, you know, um, we haven't been trained maybe to the degree of like a professional counselor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if a kid's um, facing some type of very traumatic thing and maybe it's occurring again and again, we have to try to identify that and recognize that and um, sometimes, you know, help get them removed from that situation. Mm -hmm. um, and then other times, I think, uh, as you guys have said, you know, we're, we're reaching out uh, relationally mm -hmm. and we're getting them um, some type of uh, counsel within that, that youth group. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I think it kind of comes down to finding this, if we can, identifying the source of that uh, anxiety and depression, which can be uh, really hard to do because mm -hmm. some, some of our teenagers are really good actors mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. are depressed on the inside and yeah. they're anxious. They but covered. you wouldn't even notice at yeah. youth group yeah. or um, on social media. Well, yeah. at what point do you think it's important to bring the parents in? Is there a point of severity where you say, you know, we'd better call a parent in here? Mm -hmm. that, or is it best in your feeling that you don't do that? So I would answer that question as a parent. I would say as a parent, I'd want to know as soon as possible uh, to what is going on mm -hmm. with uh, my teen, especially in the area of anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. uh, I know beforehand we were talking, and I think Andrew, you mentioned uh, that you know is the pa it's the parent's role to be the mm -hmm. discipler and to raise the parent, and we only see them one hour a week yeah. if they come every week. Mm -hmm. That's a, right. That's a handicap. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's on a good. That's a good. That's a good measurement once yeah. every week for for 52 weeks. But um, the reality is is that if we're not partnering with parents somehow then we have to, we have to figure out, we're, then we're, we're not really approaching it the best we can. Mm -hmm. And so we want to definitely approach, approach parents as we try to figure out what condition, what's leading to this anxiety and depression. What kind of tools can you give pastors? I mean, obviously it's going to be different for each child and parent, but in the main, is there or are there tools that you can give parents based on your, I'll, I'll call it, diagnosis of what the mm -hmm. child's problem is, because you, you are seeing perhaps another uh, from another vantage point than the parent even sees the child. And um, maybe if you can get to that parent without the parent feeling threatened mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by what you're perceiving to be the problem and sharing that with you, what, what tools can you bring to the table for the parent? Uh, boy, it's really quiet on that one. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, didn't mean to scare anybody. <laughs> I would just say, um, I would say to a parent not, not to try to overcomplicate things. Mm -hmm. ah. um, mm -hmm. That, you know, things are better, um, better caught than taught in the home. So um, if they can really develop an atmosphere for uh, their teenager to feel comfortable, to tell them difficult things and as a parent I think we want to see our kids um, think that we have it all together yeah. we're perfect we're setting the example well uh, but I, I'd say sometimes it'd be okay to say hey you know I know you're struggling with this maybe I've I've messed up here in the past or I I battled with this so they know like hey I'm not coming at you as this you know I'm not looking down as at you um, I'm here to help you and so there's kind of, I guess, a combination of you're de trying to develop that atmosphere. And there's, I think, a, probably a number of ways to do that uh, within your home. You're, you're setting an example, but the example isn't always trying to, to look 
like you have it all together, but um, letting them know it's okay to be human, but how do we, how do we get through this uh, together? So um, I guess you're, you're asking how, to, how do we communicate through that, to, that to a parent uh, in a practical way. Yeah, so that they can, from your vantage point that you are now sharing with them, they can go mm -hmm. home and, and perhaps implement some things. Yeah. And, and, and it's showing a collabor collaboration between yes. you and the parent uh, yeah. for, the, yes. for the same end, and that is to, for the embedment of the child. Yeah. Another tools, a couple other tools I would also suggest is, you know, we, have, we do have some great uh, counseling uh, communities in, mm -hmm. our, in our own community, mm -hmm. now in Allen County mm -hmm. community. Uh, I know our church has utilized Cornerstone of Hope as a, a place where we'll invite them in to speak to our parents about uh -huh. anxiety or grief. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've also, uh, one of the resources I go to as a pastor is an organization called Sticky Faith out of Fuller Seminary. What is it called again? Sticky Faith. Sticky Faith. But they have a parent What does that book. mean? Uh, it's just about trying to, how do, how, do you, how do you raise teens and families where the faith sticks through the college experience uh, and into adulthood? Yeah. And, uh, and that organization, Fuller Youth Institute is the name of that organization. They put out a parent book that is really about doing exactly what you're saying, creating mm -hmm. very transparent, authentic conversations that are grace-filled, where teens and parents could talk about like what's really going on without trying to put a mask on. And yeah. uh, one of their books is a parenting book. It's an amazing book. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the issues I think that would be akin to what we're discussing is self-worth, wouldn't you think? Mm, absolutely. And, uh, do you see a lot of that? that you oh. have to deal with and how do you approach that? Absolutely. How, how do you recognize that? Social media and Instagram and Snapchat and all of those things that our students are on um, really does impact how they view themselves. You know, there's, mm -hmm. I read in a study once that there's a different language to Instagram and, you know, cropping someone out of a photo means that you're no longer friends with them. Um, and it's wow. this uncommunicated language, but it really does affect their self-worth. I had a student the yeah. other week say, well, if my sister gets more likes on her photo than I do, I take mine down because it's not important wow. enough. Wow. And I was like, that's so sad because yeah. your worth is not based on a yeah. photo. It's based on you being a child of God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I know for the females, especially in our group, um, that social media and all of those things really have impacted how they view themselves and um, what is beautiful and what is pretty um, and mm -hmm. what, and it's not necessarily what God is saying about them. It's what the world is saying. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I noticed even in God's creation of, e, of uh, Adam, that is, it, you know, when God was creating the world, every now and then he'd stop and look at his hand and say, it is good. He'd mm. go on to do something else and he'd say, it is good. But his first negative pronouncement about his own creation was, it is not good that the man should be alone. Mm -hmm. So obviously he has designed us with a social nature. Absolutely. And we are meant to relate to one another. Is it possible, too, that when a child has low self-esteem, that that child is vulnerable to outside sources that can lead to drugs, sexual abuse, and all those other things? Is that possible? Yeah, I, th I, think, that, I think that when, you, when the voice that you're not tuned into, if, 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 so there's a, voice, there's a voice that happens in, in the Gospels where Jesus is baptized, and he comes out of the water and God says, this is my beloved son. Yes, yes. If we could tune into that voice that says mm -hmm. that we're beloved, that we're good, that the Father is pleased with us, mm -hmm. then I think that would protect us from a lot of influences, including the influence of our self-talk, mm -hmm. which often Absolutely. leads us to those places. Yeah. And I think that's one of the most powerful voices that we can learn to tune into, the voice of God that says you're loved. We need to take a break, but you, you, you're really building on something. I want to talk about the voice of the father because that's, that's got to be a strong voice to a child, the voice of the father, what the father is mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. And I want to deal with that in a moment. We're going to take a break, let you know how you can contact us with your questions so that we can answer your questions right here on this program. We'll be right back. Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion.
All right, we're back and we're having some heavy, heavy discussion. And let me say this, Pastor Phil, um, the father's voice is very strong in the home, whether it's positive or negative. The Bible even teaches us that the children get their self-esteem from the father. Does the father, does not the father have to be told the weightiness he has? I learned that from my own five children, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes. And you know what my kids would say to me? They say, Dad, sometimes it's not what you say, it's, it's the way you mm -hmm. say it. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that you have to take any person in an authority position, especially a father figure uh, in a parental, a parental role, has to take serious, like, their tone, their voice, and the messages they convey, uh, not, not only on how they talk, but also kind of like how you live. Mm -hmm. uh, those things matter. And then if you look at, if you look at like the statistics and the, the studies that have been out on like what, it, what are like key indicators for a teen who is going to grow in their faith, you see it then, you see it over and over again how it's the mother and the father and the grandparents and yeah. they have faith mm -hmm. over and over again. The ones that they, the, the, what they model, right? Uh -huh. Not necessarily what they say, but what they model mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. a key indicator for how, what kind of voice they're going to listen to, who they're going to become, their identity as they grow older. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are, and there are Bible characters that we can refer to to teach that to, uh, to uh, parents. Do, do you believe in parenting classes? Isn't, isn't that a good concept yeah. to have in a church, parenting classes? And not just for parents of the little bitty ones. Mm. Good Lord, I mean, parents with teenagers today really need to know how to arm themselves to protect Absolutely. their children. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no comment. Go ahead. I, uh, I just want to say too, uh, you're talking about, you know, the voice of a father and the parents and what uh, the way they live their life. And sometimes, um, after, actually quite often there are, are teenagers that don't, they don't have uh, <sighs> biological mm -hmm. parents anymore yes, for whatever yes. reason. And if they do, usually, uh, usually it's one or the other. Mm -hmm. And I'd say the, the lack of a voice in their life mm -hmm. uh, often speaks um, louder than anything mm -hmm. because they just have this kind of uh, chasm of uh, you know why why wasn't I good enough why aren't mm -hmm. they around and they're trying mm -hmm. to fill in that blank by themselves and sometimes blaming themselves for the parent not being yeah. there yeah. Mm -hmm. yes oh. so. and this does this not open the door to de to gangs I mean the kids want to have an affiliation with somebody, they want to feel accepted by somebody, the gangs tend to bring something into their lives that uh, the parent may not be bringing. I think it definitely opens the door for them to find their belonging in things that are not good for them. You know, whether it is gangs, whether it is just the wrong crowd at yeah. school, um, but it really does open the door if they're not, if they don't know where they belong, who they are, who loves them, then they're going to go seek all of those things in sometimes the wrong places. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where us as youth pastors can kind of step in at times and say, hey, you know, we know you want to belong. We know you want a place where you feel loved. Come join us on a Wednesday or Sunday yeah. night or whatever mm -hmm. um, because we love you and you belong here and you belong more importantly to the Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. And He loves you more than anybody Perfect. ever could. So. Idea, I don't want to talk idea to of belonging yeah. and like identity and yes. just that I think that's huge especially in the teenage years mm -hmm. it, it is just that's a huge thing of, of understanding and and I think that's where we see a lot of the, you know even as we talked about social media causing maybe anxiety and stress it's because you can see or, or you say I want to be in that crowd or I want to be with them and look they've got it I, I want to belong there and I want to be like that or be included in that or be associated with mm -hmm. that and man I think yeah that Identity is, is a huge thing. Uh, and, and as you said, who loves you? Who are you loved by? And um, mm. that, yeah, that, that's just a, a huge thing for a teen. And if you can find it one place, and, and hopefully you can find it at church and youth group, and we can be, yes. you know, uh, one thing that uh, a scripture that I always like to, to refer students back to is, is Ephesians uh, 2.10. Mm. And depending on what, what translation you're in, it talks about you are God's masterpiece or workmanship. Mm -hmm. You know, you're mm -hmm. created. Uh, for good works that God has planned for you in advance. That's uh, Ephesians 2.10. Yeah, and, and if you think about that, scriptures. like, mm -hmm. you know, a masterpiece was, you know, put together with purpose and intent and, you yes. know, very delicately done and, and it has purpose yeah. behind it and, yeah. and, and, you know, time was put into it and effort. And, 
and that's that's you and you are god's masterpiece and and he's got a plan for your life you know good deeds that he's planned for you in advance yeah, yep, and he made you yep. just the way he wanted you yeah you know yeah. It's, it's once again easy to look at other people and say oh look what they have or i wish i was like that and all mm. these things and saying no no god has created you exactly the way he wanted you to fulfill certain things that he has planned for you yes. and hopefully you know once again we're talking about those voices that you want to be teaching students hopefully they can find their identity there and say mm. no no you are exactly how god created you and yeah. he wanted you this way don't don't look at Instagram and say, I wish I was them. No, no he made you the way you wanted you. Yeah. God didn't yeah. mess up. Yeah. You know, so you know, that's, hopefully that's a, a, an identity or a, a, a view of their self-worth that we can impart yeah. to them mm -hmm. realizing, no, God has made you just how he wants you. Yeah. You have something to offer. Excellent. And so that's, that, you know, whether they always get that, you know, I try to tell them that, you know, they got to hear it. And have them, yeah, I was going to say, have them, have them read it, you know. Yeah. And, and I love it best in the Amplified Version. Mm -hmm. The wording in the Amplified Version of Ephesians 2.10 yeah. is just marvelous. Doesn't this also dovetail into bullying? Because now on the opposite end of this, mm -hmm. the child is being rejected. Mm -hmm. He or she is reaching out to be accepted, but they're being rejected. And not only that, being, they're being bullied down. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see instances of bullying and the effects of that in the church? Yeah. Oh, you're afraid to talk about it? <laughs> <or what? Yeah. laughs> <laughs> yes, you are afraid to yeah. talk about it. <laughs> so I, I think bullying, bullying is, is a, uh, it's a, it can be a difficult thing to navigate. Yes, mm -hmm. it can. Uh, because you're talking about somebody else's, you're talking about trying to control somebody else's behavior mm -hmm. that you have no control over. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things you think about is how can we create safe places? And I think that's the goal of a lot of our teachers and our, and our educational and, and, and all those places that work with minors, they want to create safe places. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to start looking at how can we create safe communities for teens that participate and whatever they're trying to do, whether it's gaining knowledge, whether it's a sport, whether it's an, an extracurricular activity. Uh, and because when I think about the word justice scripturally, I always think about right community. You know, mm -hmm. God is trying to create right community. And, and when we talk about bullying, bullying is an issue that breaks down right community. And so one of the things we have to talk about is how do even as we as youth pastors in our youth ministries create safe space mm -hmm. is one of the things we have to address. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure we have to address also like how we navigate with teens and maybe you all have some ideas. I'd love to hear how you all have ideas about mm -hmm. how we navigate teens who are being bullied yeah. across that. I, 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 you know, not to over-spiritualize stuff, but I look at how King David was being, well, before he was king, when he was a boy, how he was being bullied by Goliath. Mm -hmm. But his tactic was to come back yeah. with some self-worth and he said, I'm going to cut your head yes. off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he, had, he had confidence. He had some mm -hmm. confidence there. Um, but isn't, isn't it an issue where we, we need to also find out, in addition to the child that's being bullied, we need to get to that child that is doing the bullying to find out what's behind that. Mm -hmm. What's behind that kind of behavior? What, what do you think might be behind that behavior? I mean, I think it's a lot of what we've just been discussing. Yeah. It's, that's a way to belong or feel self-worth to feel better than that other person. By or, putting them down. Yeah, or, or to feel cool in the eyes of whoever. I, I think when, when you get to the heart of people who, who are bullying or, or you know, picking on other kids, or whatever, you find a lot of that is there's uh, you know, something in their life that they're, they're trying to belong or they're trying to... They're insecure sometimes. There, there's a lot of that. And, and even, uh, you know, even we talked about issues with parents and home life and things going on there. And, and maybe you want to feel some kind of power in your life and, and feel some kind of, I'm in control of something. And, and when you take that out in the wrong way, that, that often leads to that. And, and I've seen that in, in several situations where if you really can get to the, to the heart of the kid who's bullying you'll see there's, there's a lot of cry out because of a lot of hurt in their life too. I mean, they're, they're looking for something as well. And that seems to be their, their outlet or the way to find it, you know, all in the wrong way. Mm. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of hurt going on there as well. And if you don't get to that on the guy that's doing the bullying, as he or she gets older, they may wind up in trouble with the law. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because they, they use stronger and stronger bullying tactics mm -hmm. that can eventually cross mm -hmm. over and uh, disobey the law and, and they wind up in, in jail. Mm -hmm. So, Or with a lot of regret. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've met a lot of people yeah. who bully people yeah. in school and it's just, it sticks with you. You regret it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I've talked to a few who were like that who yeah. uh, say that they do regret mm -hmm. yeah. bullying mm -hmm. people. They recognize later in their years how their actions were affecting other people and they didn't have the self-awareness at Isn't that age nice. to do that. I wonder what brings a person to the point where they finally realize and begin to have regrets 
for that behavior where, where they're, now they're willing to change because of that past regret, mm -hmm. they're going to change their behavior. Yeah. What does it take to bring a person to that point? The earlier the better, obviously, but well, <laughs> I think what a does lot it of take? it is the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, yes. of bringing that conviction of, you know, that was wrong and the way you behaved was not in line with how God wants us mm -hmm. to behave and treat everybody because, you know, at, at the end of the day, we're supposed to be treating people as that they are made in the image of God and loved by God, regardless of their background or what they believe every person on earth is created in the image of God mm -hmm. um, and so I I truly believe it's the work of the Holy Spirit that brings a person to that change of the saying you know what I did mess up um, but I'm willing to right that wrong uh, and walking with that person in that whether it's a teenager or whether it's someone that's you know 40 years old and is just now figuring that out I mean yeah. that's the church's role is to walk with them in that yeah. And sometimes for the person who's doing the bullying, I would imagine that going back to the p person or persons mm -hmm. that he or she has bullied to apologize yeah. can be a part of their own healing in yeah. addition to the healing yeah. of the person that was the victim. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Any other? I think, so. I think uh, a lot of it kind of what we're saying is kind of a common thread of what uh, Landon was talking about when he was mentioning identity in Ephesians 2.10. It's like... Um, I really liked a lot of the things he said about, you know, even the, the bully himself kind of has identity issues and he's um, trying to find his self-worth. So he's pushing people down to, to elevate himself. So it's, um, it's so crucial to, for them to know their value in Jesus um, mm -hmm. and that they're, they're a child of God, as, as Tori said. And um, so I, I think that um, practically, in a practical sense in our youth group, um, some things I would try to do uh, would be to not only address some of that stuff in our messages, yes. I think mm -hmm. all of us would do, uh, but to, um, to, as you guys said, address the bully, address the person being bullied, but we can do practical things as in if you have the manpower in your leadership team, if you do have that, not everybody has that luxury, mm -hmm. to scatter them amongst the kids mm -hmm. as much as you can and to try to nip it early. Mm -hmm. So like, a lot of it is sly at first, I would say, mm -hmm. and it's hard to recognize because even my group, we're rowdy. We like to tease each other. Yeah. We're competitive. Uh, but sometimes somebody will just kind of cross the line and, you know, we're playing four square and they're like, everyone's chanting like, yeah, you're trash or something. Yeah. And they're like, all right, you know, I'm going to shut this down. I'm going to mm -hmm. say, hey, we don't talk about people that way. I know you're teasing, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, we don't ever call somebody trash. And um, I think when we set the the boundary high mm -hmm. which is really hard to do it's hard to recognize it if you have a large group it's really hard to recognize it early but i think um that would be a, a practical sense very good we're going to head to do there you know there are two christian psychologists that have a book out on boundaries townsend and mm -hmm. what's the other one? cloud cloud mm -hmm. townsend and cloud mm -hmm. that book on boundaries is a very good one to read thank you very much we appreciate uh, all of the contribution to the mm -hmm. program we certainly hope that uh, people will be blessed this same final pa fine panel that you're looking at now will be back with us again next week. We're going to double the salary so <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and have more good discussion. So tune in again next week, would you? Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Take care. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.